Carla Louise Herholt. I am a scientist currently working for a company called CGEN in Seattle. Um, I actually won't be talking very much about the kind of work we do. Uh, it's cancer therapy. Uh, the question's right at the end. I'm happy to take some questions on oncology to the extent of my limits. Um, my title today is called Avoid Boring People. And there was an asterisk that you might have seen um, in, in that. And the reason for that asterisk is that I have shamelessly stolen the title of my talk uh, from um, a guy you might have heard of whose name was James Watson. Now, James Watson, of course, is one of the famous Watson and Crick uh, who invented um, DNA, invented, that's not the right word, discovered the structure of DNA. Um, and he wrote several memoirs of his time as a scientist. And one of them um, was called uh, avoid boring people. And his point in this lesson was that uh, the title, you should take it in twofold. You should always avoid boring people because life is too short. And uh, there are so many interesting things to learn. I'm just gonna let the ambulance go past my uh, apartment building. Okay, uh, and the other thing is that you should also avoid boring people. So I really hope that I managed to avoid boring you all this evening um, and that there's a little bit of something in here for everyone. Um, so this is really a um, collection of things that I have learned over my, my career in STEM so far. So before I get started, as Javier said, I, I come from England. Um, and just as a, a brief approximation, as an introduction, um, this is, you know, Javier said I can't sing. I also can't draw, unfortunately. So this is an artistic rendition of uh, the UK. Um, I come from a city called Exeter, which is down here in Devon. It's well known for sheep. Uh, it's where the Plymouth Brethren set off from um, to found America. And also there are plenty more sheep. Um, I then went to Oxford uh, for my uh, undergraduate and my master's degree, which as we all know is really best known for being Hogwarts. I went to London for my PhD, uh, which is the center of the universe and actually quite literally the center of the universe since Greenwich Mean Time runs straight through the middle and Greenwich Mean Time becomes universal time in astronomy. So uh, London is the best city in the world and I encourage all of you to visit one day. Okay, so out of my lessons, the first one is failure is an option. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, the book um, referencing uh, or the, the book describing uh, the Apollo 13 um uh moon mission that failed and there the uh, flight director famously said failure is not an option and i'm here to tell you that failure is indeed an option um and that is known as there are also scattered little pieces of advice through here this was one that my graduate advisor gave me when something hadn't worked out in lab and she said carla if a door closes in front of you go and find a brick go around the corner and smash open a window and so uh it's one i've i've held close to my heart. So Javier uh, gave you my resume. Um, you know, I, not to brag, but I, I did pretty well, right? So like I was a valedictorian at school. I went to the University of Oxford. I'm queen nerd, which means I was president of the Physics Society. Uh, I graduated. I did my, my GRE. It was in the 99th percentile. I did my PhD at Imperial College, which you haven't probably heard of, but it's one of the top five universities in the world. And then I moved on to being a senior fellow at the University of Washington. Uh, and now have this job as a scientist. Awesome, I'm so great. But the secret to all of this is that none of this is really how it appears. Uh, I was rejected from the school that I went to, the high school I went to in my first year of application. I was seven years old when I hit that first rejection. I was told that I wasn't quite the material uh, they were looking for um, and I, I wasn't the right fit for the school. Uh, Oxford is a, a collegiate university, um, which means there are lots of small colleges within it. And uh, I was rejected from the college that I'd applied to and spent three very sad days under my duvet, convinced that I had not got into my dream school until a letter arrived from someone else giving me a backup place at their college. Uh, I got a 99 percentile in my GRE. I totally failed my physics GRE. Like, didn't even come close. Like, failed, failed. Um, which you know is pretty embarrassing when you have a degree in physics from one of the best universities in the world. But there you go, failed the physics GRE. Uh, I did my PhD at Imperial. I was rejected from MIT, Stanford, University of Chicago, a bunch of other schools, probably because I failed the physics GRE. But you know, I'm just gonna say they didn't want me. Uh, University of Washington, rejected from MIT again. So those of you in the audience who are uh, 
headed to Boston, hopefully not virtually in the fall. Um, I don't even care. I'm not bitter. I'm really not bitter. Um, and I'm not even going to mention uh, the many, 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 many jobs that I applied for uh, out of my postdoc uh, at the University of Washington. Um, and I was ghosted by, I would say, 90% of those. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that um, failure, uh, especially as a scientist, is something that you become intimately familiar with. Um, there will be those days, like I mentioned when I didn't get the letter I wanted from Oxford, that there is no other recourse than to hide under the duvet, under the comforter, not get off the couch. Um, and those days are hard. And those days, especially in, in science, happen more often than not. But the secret is that you can go around uh, and smash the window in the side. Each one of these failures ended up um, being for the best. Uh, Imperial was my last choice. It was purely a fly email address, uh, email address, email to the advisor I ended up working with. Um, and it changed the course of my life. And my mentorship from that advisor changed my direction professionally um, and my outlook in a lot of things. Um, the position at the University of Washington was the same deal. Um, it has opened doors that I never thought was possible. At the time of the failure, you think that is the end of the road. And it never is. There is always uh, a silver lining. Um, and I am a firm believer, um, my own personal religion is that you are always where the universe wants you to be. Um, okay, so lesson two, your comfort zone is overrated. Uh, also known as scientists like magpies really like shiny things. So when I was a delegate um, in 2006, uh, I remember sitting um, in the lecture hall at science camp and I was really afraid, you know, I was about to go to college, I was about to start my scientific career. And I was really, really worried that I would become the world's expert in a thing nobody cared about, uh, that nobody understood, and that I would be pigeonholed uh, into a small, tiny bubble that um, I would never be able to get out of. And as I listened to all of the lectures at Science Camp, and I really truly hope that you've had that ex same experience, and I'm sure Brian and his team have made sure that you've had the programming to see this as well, it's that almost everyone I came across in STEM has changed subjects. Maybe not fields as I have from going from physics all the way through to molecular biology. Um, people have <laughs> slightly smaller life crises sometimes, um, but everybody changes projects and that has been really reassuring for me. Uh, so this, this first story is how a physicist um, ended up uh, being a molecular biologist. So this is a photo of me uh, with a muon spectrometer uh, at, the, um, at a beam line in, in the UK. It's one of our national labs. Uh, and so you, muons are heavy electrons, fat electrons, if you will, and you can fire them. Basically, most of physics is throwing stuff at other stuff and seeing what falls apart when you throw stuff together. Um, you know, it's trying to find out how a watch works by smashing it on the ground. Uh, that's basically most of physics. Uh, so this was a muon spectrometer throwing muons because they're heavy at things and seeing what happened. So, the, you know, this was the path I thought I was going to take. Um, very interested in space science, really enjoyed these kind of big equipment. Um, and, and big studies that were fundamental um, to the nature of the universe. And I told my biology high school teacher when she tried to take me, uh, make me do uh, the equivalent of AP biology or chemistry, and I only took physics and two different types of maths. Uh, and I said to her at 17 years old, I'm never gonna do biology. Uh, physics is the only true science. Why would I waste my time with anything else? And funnily enough, uh, my, that, that teacher had a PhD in molecular biology and had spent a long time being a vaccine scientist. So the irony that I ended up making vaccines um, 15 years later was uh, not lost on me. She was right all along. So as part of my PhD in material science, um, what I was looking at was HIV. And so this is gonna be a little bit of that story of how that transition to from physics to molecular biology happens and really the value in having people who have different backgrounds working together on a problem. So this is the world map um, of uh, HIV infection. Um, this data is now a few years old, um, but primarily you can see that the majority of these cases are uh, in Africa um, and in Southeast Asia. 
um, and the burden of cases there is, is very high. And the percentage of the world receiving uh, ART, which is antiretroviral therapy, which are the drugs that are given to slow HIV, is you know, about half of that percentage. But in italics, you'll see that those numbers um, are skewed. And so the most people receiving the drugs are not the people who where the, the burden is uh, highest. And the amazing thing about antiretroviral therapy, uh, do not try and say that five times quickly, um, is that if uh, you or I were infected with HIV today, uh, if we were given quick access to those drugs, um, we would have a almost normal lifespan. Uh, patients who are diagnosed you know, at the age of 25 uh, with HIV today are expected to live until their 70s or 80s. So this is a huge, huge change um, from when uh, the AIDS epidemic really started back in the 80s. Um, and in, uh, with Javier beforehand, we were talking about how the difference in the pandemic between the HIV pandemic and the COVID pandemic has been so fascinating to me because that understanding of what is this virus um, is so much faster. So this is the problem that uh, exists in the world. It still exists. Um, and so, you know, little old grad student me who didn't know anything about biology was like, we can fix this problem. Uh, and so uh, a thing that we ended up using a lot of and thinking about um, are nanomaterials. And so just to give you kind of an idea of scale, nanomaterials are anything um, that are 10 to the minus nine meters. Um, so an HIV virus uh, is um, pretty large. It's about hundred nanometers. And regular bacteria is at an order of magnitude bigger than that. Blood cells about two or three times the size of that. And so when we end up with a diameter of your human hair ends up way out in the micrometers. And so there are a bunch of materials and um, I, my PhD was in material science. Uh, and so there are the materials that we think of when we think about building bridges or building skyscrapers, but material science also cares about uh, the very, very small materials. So for instance, buckminster fullerene, buckyballs, which are way down at um, one nanometer. Um, and the reason that we are interested about building things at a nanometer scale is that then we can start to interact directly on the same level as some of these pathogens and proteins that are in our body. So we need to engineer at the same scale that our bodies engineer or that nature engineers at, really from the bottom all the way up. Um, if, when the pandemic is over, you ever find yourself in the best city in the world, in London, this is a cup that is in the British Museum. Um, it's a museum full of things that British people have uh, stolen over the years from other uh, sovereign nations um, and really should probably give back, but that's a political conversation for another day. This is the Lycurgus Cup and it was built, it was built, it was made um, by glass blowers in the Roman Empire in about 1 AD. So it's very, very old. And what you're looking at is not two separate cups. This is the same cup, but it's put under different light conditions. So on the left in green, it's under reflected light. And on the right in red, it's uh, transmitted light. So the light source is now behind it. And you can see that they are two different colors. So way back, these artisan glass blowers in the Roman Empire already knew that there were certain things they could add into glass that affected the properties of this material. And it wasn't until much, much later that anyone worked out what they had put into these materials to give them this amazing uh, properties. And so the answer um, is gold. And you'll say to me, Carla, gold isn't red and gold is certainly not green. So what are you talking about? Well, if we think about the structure of a metal, um, you have probably all in your chemistry classes heard of this idea of the ocean of electrons. And that is in a regular lattice of a metal, um, the electrons are free to move. The outer electrons in the orbit of an atom are free to move and jump between atom to atom to atom. So we think of this as the sea of electrons in a metal or the gas of electrons. They're not fixed in one place as we would traditionally expect in the kind of Bohr model of an atom. And what this means is that these metals and in particular gold have very special properties when they interact with light. So what happens here is that when a light wave, which um, we're thinking of light as an electromagnetic wave here, or an oscillation of an electric field and a magnetic field. When that beam of light interacts with these electrons, uh, they cause a resonance. And so uh, all of the electrons will respond um, to the incoming light and move to one side of the metal. And then of course, we know that opposites attract and like uh, charges 
um, repel each other. So you've then clustered all of these negative charges on one side of the metal. So what will happen is those electrons will try and readjust and move back to the other side of the metal. They interact with the light wave again, they move back again. And so we set up this wave action. It's called a plasmon in the metal. It's a plasmon resonance. And the frequency at which this plasmon moves through the electrons um, of a metal is determined by the size of the material. So if we have a large piece of gold, you know, the, the kind of gold ingot I wish I had uh, in my safe. Um, we don't really see those effects because it's bouncing. There are so many different um, imperfections in that large block that uh, they all overlap. And so we see block as a, a, the block as a uh, bulk gold color. But if we make very, very, very small particles of gold with a countable number of atoms, that begins to be different. We've started to put boundaries on those waves. And a way to think of this is a bit like imagining the waves in a swimming pool versus the waves in the ocean. The waves in the ocean have a much longer way to go. There are also a lot more of them, and so they run at different intervals. And if you're in the middle of the ocean, far away from the beach, you'll notice a general sway, but you won't notice individual waves necessarily. In a swimming pool, if someone jumps in one end, you get a very noticeable uh, wave that goes in one direction. And so the smaller a particle, the more confined it is, the more obvious those resonances become, uh, and they become, uh, we end up absorbing and reflecting light in different ways because the light that comes in and interacts with these electrons is then different to the light that is reflected and uh, absorbed from that material. So in practicality, what that ends up meaning is that as the gold particles change size, the solution that we see changes color. So on the left here in bright red are very, very, very small particles of gold. On the right, in that more purplish blue color, are very large particles of gold. Um, and this makes sense if we think about wavelengths, um, a small particle, um, will the resonance will equal small wavelengths, which means it will absorb all of the small wavelength light. Small wavelength light are the blue to greens, so that the only light that we see is red. Bigger particles will absorb the bigger wavelengths, um, and so the only light that we see are the small ones, which are the blue. So it's kind of a little backwards of how you would initially think about it, but it makes sense when you think of uh, the light that's absorbed instead of um, what we end up seeing. It turns out gold uh, nanoparticles aren't the only things that do this. Uh, on the right here is silver in different shapes. You can see there's a huge range of color. And then we can make different shapes in particles. So we can have not just spheres, we can have nano rods, so we get a, a much starker contrast. We can have nano shells, which are hollow. Um, and we can have nano cages of gold, which are multifaceted. And again, we see this beautiful spectrum of colors. All this is great. Well, why do we care? Well, to go back to HIV, what we care about is, can we use this technology to make a detection test for HIV that is as simple as a pregnancy test? You don't need a medical degree or a PhD to tell you that there is a difference between blue or red. People read pregnancy tests every day. Um, you don't require scientific training. So can we make some kind of system that allows uh, providers in the field to give rapid diagnostic tests that will allow patients to know that they have a positive confirmation earlier, which prevents spread of disease faster, we know this from COVID, uh, and also um, allows them to get access to treatment faster. So the nice thing about gold is that it's bioinert. It means our bodies don't react to it. It's one of the reasons many people have gold jewelry. Our bodies don't really see it. It doesn't upset them. There's no immune reaction to it. We also can attach things to the surface of gold. So we can put DNA on the surface. We can put proteins on the surface. We can put small peptides on the surface. We can put synthetic polymers on the surface. We can put organic molecules on the surface. All of these things will interact with different biological things. So the question is, can we put something on the surface that will recognize a certain, um, in this case, protein, an HIV antigen, and then trigger a reaction that we can measure that will tell us that yes, this virus exists in solution. Um, and one of the ways of doing this, uh, but the reason for this is that we talked about small particles and big particles, but this effect also happens uh, uh, 
if you clump lots of small particles together. So if you imagine putting Velcro on the outside of all of the small particles and sticking them all together, you've made a pseudo big particle. And the light wave and the surface plasmon can still move through that and it will act like a big particle. So the idea here is let's make a Velcro that recognizes HIV, sticks all these particles together and moves that whole system from a red line to a blue line. It's pretty straightforward. Um, in a lab, and uh, you probably have heard a lot about this um, from the COVID testing, the normal way of doing this is with something called an ELISA. You use antibodies to recognize certain proteins, you cause a chemical reaction, and again, it changes from a color to a color. And the work that we were doing during my graduate work was to instead cut out some of these complicated things and trigger growth of nanoparticles through this. You don't need to worry too much about this diagram. It's just to say it's very similar to how, you know, COVID is detected, uh, antibody tests work, um, but we're trying to make a slightly more sensitive version of it. And it turns out it works super well. So BSA is bovine serum albumin. It's the main protein that is found. Albumin is the main protein that is found in blood. In this case, this is extracted from cow blood. It's our negative control. So you can see all of our particles here in both lines are red. Uh, in the presence of this protein, there's no reaction. PSA is a prostate, prostate cancer antigen, um, and P24 is a protein that's found on the outside of HIV. So these uh, nanoparticles were set up to recognize either PSA or P24 and aggregate in the presence of those proteins. Now, what you can see is that these are, uh, you can clearly see that there's a change to blue in the top line in both of these cases, and the grams per milliliter um, is down to 10 to the minus 18. Now, this was one of the most sensitive measurements uh, ever detected in solution. Um, it's a basically a single molecule detection, which is really the holy grail. Um, so if you can detect even one particle, one HIV virus, right, you know you have it much, much longer than a lot of the conventional tests, and you can get on that uh, very vital therapies much, much faster and really slow the virus in its tracks. Um, so that was my first story about uh, nanoparticles and why my background in physics right, allows me to start thinking about um, biology because I'm interacting with it from the point of uh, electrons, wave lights, all of these things that I've learned as a physicist. So I will take a quick pause here in case there are any questions on nanoparticle diagnostics. Uh, I've got a question. Mm -hmm. um, have you or do you use uh, do you use quantum mechanics to um, when you were working with nano structures? Um, when nanoparticles get very, 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 very small, um, so we're talking about twenty atoms, you do have to use quantum mechanics to analyze it. Beyond that, um, more kind of Newtonian physics will allow you to get to the same answers, but the mathematics gets very complicated. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. So this assay is still in development. I just picked up that chat, sorry, to taking, taking the thunder from my moderators. Um, it's one of these things that's still in development. Uh, very similar assays work. And in fact, pregnancy tests do themselves use nanoparticles. Um, those of you who've heard of rapid diagnostic tests for COVID, again, they're using nanoparticle-based uh, diagnostic technology. Um, you will know maybe from having heard about rapid diagnostic tests that the false positive rate and false negative rate is often much higher. So one of the big challenges that remains with this is um, improving the accuracy. The problem there is that things like salt and changes in salt can cause those same aggregations. And that can lead us to rates, uh, false detections, um, which is one thing if you get told you have COVID and you don't, you know, if someone tells you you have HIV and you don't, um, that's, you know, it's, it's giving someone a life sentence. So you need to be very careful about those kind of developments of diagnostics. Okay, uh, I'm gonna move on. Um, we'll take some more questions. Um, after this next part. So lesson three, impossible is a state of mind, also known as just do it in a way, which I guess I'm probably ripping off of Nike there, but uh, it's a good motto, just do it in a way. Um, so some of you will recognize this lady, Javiera mentioned she's one of my favorites. This is Rosalind Franklin. 
term. And Rosalind Franklin was a world-class crystallographer. Uh, she should have won the Nobel Prize, but unfortunately she died at the age of about 34. Um, turns out standing in front of an x-ray source for most of your career uh, is a good way of developing ovarian cancer. So she died very, very young. Um, she was really a talent that the world should have had more of. Um, uh, and many of you will probably know the story of these two gentlemen, Watson and Crick, who were trying to solve the problem of what does, uh, what does I'm still stuck on HIV, what does DNA look like? What is its chemical structure? Um, when these guys were doing their work, um, they had uh, models, they knew that there was this, this thing that existed in cells that transferred knowledge, um, but nobody was quite sure what it was. And it turns out that this picture of the model that they have, and again, if you're ever in London, this model is in the Science Museum, the actual model in this photograph is now in the Science Museum. Uh, they had this model totally back, because they had the sugar backbone uh, on the inside and the, the uh, base pairs way out. They were way off. And one day they were in, uh, in the center and Rosalind Franklin had been working on the same problem for a long time. Um, and she'd been doing X-ray crystallography um, of, of the molecule um, and uh, had some data lying on her desk. X-ray crystallography, uh, I'm gonna pause there and go slightly backwards to X-ray crystallography. So X-ray crystallography uh, is very straightforward if you're looking at a regular array of atoms. So if we have you know, a metal or a salt where every atom is in a very rigid place, it has a lattice structure that is very defined, X-ray crystallography is really quite straightforward. We fire X-rays um, at the surface of the material and they will diffract um, from, from uh, an atom. So the, the ray will hit an atom and it will bounce back. Um, there are many layers in a, in a crystal. And so uh, we'll see that we have different um, diffractions coming back, um, different reflections of those rays bouncing back again. And D here is the spacing between those atoms. Now we know that waves have constructive and deconstructive interference. And so as all of these rays come back from an atom, depending on the spacing between them, you'll get this very distinct pattern that will tell you what atom is in what place, how far apart, is each atom from every other atom in this picture. So this, this starry night picture is very typical of what you will see of a metal or a salt. Turns out you can also get proteins and things like DNA to crystallize and take x-rays of those. The process is just as easy, but understanding what those dots means is much, much harder. So this is very famous. This is photograph 52. And this is the piece of data that Rosalind Franklin had lying around in her office, which, uh, Watson and Crook found. Uh, they were not given it, they found it uh, by wandering through her office when she wasn't there. Um, and uh, used this piece of data to realize that their um, model was wrong um, and uh, ended up winning the Nobel Prize for solving the structure of TNA. Uh, I really recommend uh, the biography that is written um, of Rosalind Franklin for anyone who needs some summer reading. Uh, it's, it's a really good read. I think it's called The, the Dark Woman. Um, it's, it's extremely inspiring. Anyway, uh, she was very disheartened by the politics of this whole situation. And so she left and started her own lab in a different university in London. And from there on, uh, she started working on tobacco, tobacco mosaic virus. So this is a virus that only affects tobacco plants. Um, plants, just like humans and animals, also suffer from viruses. And you can see that the main characteristic is that these leaves get these like very mottled shape until eventually the whole leaf dies um, and the plant can no longer photosynthesize and die. And what Rosalind did was that she extracted the viruses from these plants and was trying to get structures um, and understand what these uh, viruses look like. And this is a, an image, a microscope image of these viruses. And this is a very different shape of virus to what we're used to thinking about especially with all the images of coronavirus around, right? There are these long filamentous viruses. Ebola is also a filamentous virus. So there, it's not just plants that have viruses that look like this. And of course it's false colored. These viruses aren't actually green. Um, it just helps you to see that contrast in the electron micrograph a little better. And what she discovered is that the tobacco mosaic virus um, consists of a curl of RNA, um, which is protected by this capsid protein. 
Um, and these proteins interact with themselves and with the curl of nucleic acid. And they all stack around in this beautiful spiral all the way around to form these long filaments that are the length of the DNA or RNA that's carried. And the distance here between the RNA is then you know, uh, related to the proteins that have allowed uh, this interaction to happen and to form. Um, and so they're about 18 nanometers across. So again, we're still talking nanometer scale, but they can grow to be 300 nanometers. So they're getting to be pretty big. And when we look at this, um, those of you who were in my directed study will recognize several key features of this. You can see that we have these alpha helix shapes. Uh, these are in these little proteins, right? These little blue guys that interact with each other. And they use these alpha helices to interact with each other. And here, this little curve is the end group of the uh, nucleic acid where it's interacting um, on the side here. And there are big loopy bits, which just give uh, some flexibility to allow all of these structural elements to really stick together. So viruses do this all the time. Um, and uh, the work that the Institute for Protein Design does in Washington is to say, okay, all of these proteins have evolved. Uh, viruses evolved over millions of years to do these amazing things. Can we start to understand how proteins fold and work uh, so that we can begin to design our own ones? Um, and so again, those of you who are in so you have seen this comic. It's one of my favorites. Uh, it's from XKCD. Um, and it says, you know, what do you do? I make software that predicts how proteins fold. What do proteins look like? Is that a hard problem? Well, someone might find a harder one. Why is it so hard? Well, have you ever made a folded paper crane? Sure. Well, imagine figuring out how to fold an actual living crane and you're not allowed to have any scissors. So you have to make your scissors first. So this is very complex. It's reductionist, right? Okay, you need to have, you know, a human that lives and breathes. Well, then we need things that will take oxygen, when we need things that interact on a molecular level with oxygen. And you keep having to go down from to a more simple model that we as an engineer can build to this very complex um, thing. So hopefully you got the message from Brian and in front of you, uh, you should have a piece of paper. If you can rip that piece of paper to be vaguely square, that would be great. And then choose um, one of these structures and fold it. And I'm going to give you, my phone says it's 5.43, so I'm going to give you two minutes to fold one of these structures. I'm going to do it too. I'm going to use the paper. I'm ripping it to be square. Okay. Who has not perfectly square? You know, just good enough. I haven't done this in a while. I used to do this a lot. It's been a minute. We'll see how good this works. Okay. Oh, I have made a read. Okay. I'll show I'll show you. It's it's really not very good. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna give you another 30 seconds. Okay. So anyone who made the paper plane, will you hold it up and show me? No, oh, how can I get my, anyone make a paper plane? No, nobody made a paper plane. Okay, cool. And anyone who made a cup, will you hold them up and show me? Nice. Some of those look much better than my cup. <laughs> now, uh, the point of this is that the folds that you've made, the folds that we have to make in either of these two pieces of very, very, very simple origami, um, and apologies to those of you who are actually good at origami, um, the point is that we make the same folds, but the order in which we make those folds is really important to give us a different shape at the end, right? 
If we make some folds in one way, we end up with a paper plane. If we make them in the other way, we end up with a cup. So the way it's folded has given us its purpose or its shape, I should say. And its shape has a particular function. So if I have my glass of water, right? And I, let's see if this works. Hey, look, no leakage. It actually held water. Um, I'm gonna put it in my cup over there so that it doesn't leak all over my table. Um, it actually held water. It did the job it was designed to do. If I ask those of you who'd made a paper plane to pour water in it, you're gonna end up with a very wet laptop, right? That's not gonna work out well. And equally, if I throw this across my room, it doesn't fly very well, right? And so what this is trying to very crudely demonstrate is that the folds that something makes, a protein or a piece of paper, relate to the shape it has. And that shape really tells us what its function is. What job does it do? And so when we think of all of protein biochemistry, this is really the fundamental thing. It's a structure function relationship. So protein, protein folding problems say, okay, uh, what shape does this take? You know, what do we need to do to fold this to give it the shape? Protein design looks at it the other way. It says, if we want a certain function, what do we need to design? And so on a macro scale, if we want to cross a bridge, there are many different, oh, cross a bridge, sorry. If we want to cross a river, there are many different ways you can engineer something to get across that river. You might build a boat, you might build a bridge, but you're designing it and engineering that thing with the purpose I need to get across that river. And so that's what the Institute does. Um, and so what we were interested in is, can we build a virus? And it turns out, yes, we can. Uh, so the first thing we have to do is identify an appropriate symmetry group. Now it turns out that biology likes to use symmetry because it makes your design problem easier. You only have to in uh, engineer one interaction and symmetry will allow that to be replicated across it. Most viruses, including COVID, are icosahedral. So basically soccer balls, those are also icosahedral. And in this case, we're gonna have something that has a five-fold rotational symmetry in that it, if you turn it five times, it will look the same way uh, in each turn. And it also have a three-fold on the other axis. So if you turn it three times in the other direction, it will look the same way. And so you can kind of see this in this very complicated drawing up here that we have these triangles, which are our threefold axes. And at the top, we have our pentamers or fivefold axes. So if you spin it, you have fivefold. If you twist it, you have threefold. So we do the mathematics. We work out that this is the shape we want. Uh, we can then go and search the protein data bank. So the protein data bank is all proteins that have ever been crystallized and that we know exactly what they look like. This is a free, uh, depository of data on the internet. It's very, very powerful. Again, those of you who are at my directed study, we, we dug around a little in it. And in that database of all of the proteins that we know exist, there are ones that happen to naturally have trim trimeric symmetry and ones that have pentameric, five-fold symmetry. So we can pull in a computer, we can pull all of those three-folds and all of those five-folds, and then we can start trying to arrange them on the axis. So if you were trying to make a soccer ball or if you quilt, you cut out all the shapes and then you try and arrange them into the right shape, right? That you're making a quilted ball. So in the computer, we can make, uh, you know, place them at the right points in three dimensional space, rotate them so they fit against each other and then slide them in and out to form a full shell. And so again, power of computational science allows us to do all of those rotations and slides very, very quickly on every single protein we can lay our hands on until we find ones that we think will kind of stick together a bit like Lego bricks. And then the final step is to go in at an amino acid level. So these are the, you know, the building blocks of life. They each have certain chemical features. And what we want is to have those interact and build kind of a zipper amongst those functions. So we, we put them in the right space and then we zip them up so that now if these two proteins see each other, they will immediately form these folds or virus shapes that we want. This is a very, very quick overview of a very complex process. But basically through computational science, we can design a bunch of these structures. Then we have to go to the lab and we have to make them and we have to see whether they work. Turns out we're pretty good at this. The ones on the left are actual virus particles. These are electron microscope images. Um, so these filled balls um, are a different type of plant virus actually. 
And on the right here, um, I call these my special little snowflakes. These are the structures that we've designed in the computer. And you can see they look very similar. The important part about this is that each one of these looks identical to the other one. Um, and so this is really, really powerful in science because you have reproducibility. You can build a whole test tube of things that you know look identical, which is what viruses are also very good at doing. Now you'll notice that they're hollow and that's because they're not filled with anything. These are just protein shells. And so they're viruses in the fact that they look like viruses, but they're not viruses in that they don't have any of the mechanisms inside them the virus is used to hijack cells. So these are total little shells. They're just balls of protein, not dangerous, um, not infectious. They're just kind of a, an engineering model of can we build the right shape? We can go one step further than that. So on the right, and everybody has seen this protein picture of coronavirus a thousand times. I apologize for bringing more COVID into your life. Um, but this is a kind of an artist representation of what these proteins look like, or what the virus capsid looks like. We have the gray, which is the capsid itself of the protein, and the red here are the spike proteins, which give it the name coronavirus uh, because they stick out like little crowns from the structure. On the left is not coronavirus. On the left, we took those particles that we made and we put one of HIV's spike proteins on the outside. So those little juddings out are HIV proteins and on one of our little balls. So now to the body, this outside bit looks like it should be HIV, but of course it's empty. It doesn't have any nucleic acid in it. It's not the virus. Um, and so this is how you end up starting to design vaccines, right? We're building particles that look very similar to the virus particle themselves and to the body, all it sees, all the immune system sees are the spike proteins that it would see in case of infection with a real virus. Um, so that is one thing that uh, the Institute has been working on for a long time. Um, we have a COVID vaccine that is in trial in South Korea right now. Uh, there is a uh, RSV vaccine, which is a, a respiratory virus that small children often get. Um, Brian, I'm sure your children have probably had RSV more than once. Um, uh, and there is also a uh, multi-seasonal flu vaccine being tested by the NIH right now, um, which will allow you to have one flu shot every X number of years rather than every year. The other nice thing is that, like I said, these things are hollow, uh, which means that we can um, build them uh, to act as little cargo carriers. So we can put drugs that might be degraded by the body. We can put DNA uh, inside them, just like viruses do, and we can package all of those things inside these shells uh, and then deliver them to the body as drug delivery. So in the work that I do now at CGen, we can really care about getting cancer drugs exactly to the right cells and not distributed across the body. You probably have heard the saying that if the cancer doesn't kill you, the drugs will first. Chemo chemotherapy drugs are extremely toxic to the body. They kill any cell. So we can wrap these things that are dangerous to the body inside a shell that the body doesn't really notice until we turn a key and let that thing out. We can start doing drug delivery um, for a bunch of different things, including gene therapy uh, in a far more controlled way. Um, so that is the end of that section and I'm conscious of time. So I'm not gonna take questions now and I'm gonna scoot on to my last little section is there's a great big world outside the lab. And finding out what you don't want to do is important as knowing what you do want to do. Uh, and I have uh, <laughs> come across this in, in a couple of different times and I thought I really wanted to go down one career path. I went and tried it for a little while and discovered I did not. Uh, so during my graduate work, I spent um, uh, six months working in the UK parliament doing science policy. And I think you've already had the AAAS um, uh, session. Um, and so you've come across policy as a, as a concept and how important it is to have science in government. Um, and, uh, you know, I really like this cartoon, right? We think of scientists as being locked at, inside the ivory tower, but it turns out that there's a lot outside that tower and they, the, the world can really benefit from scientists. Um, so policy is a plan of action or a measure developed in response to a perceived need in order to achieve an outcome. And that's the important part. And that's the part that I think Politicians often forget in their talking, you forget that you actually need to achieve a certain outcome. Uh, so this is the Houses of Parliament in the UK. Fun fact, it's actually falling into the river. So this thing has been around since the 1600s. It may not be around for much longer because the whole thing is, is sinking quite rapidly <laughs> into, the, into the river. Um, 
Turns out if you build on a swamp, bad things happen, but you know, who, who knew that? Who knew that in the 1600s? Uh, and so there are many scientists and many scientific discussions in policy. When I used to give this lecture at Science Camp, obviously pre-pandemic, I would have to explain why that's important a bit more. These days we know excruciatingly well why it is important to have scientists working in government. This is a, an example um, of uh, a policy that I really enjoyed that I found when I was working there. Um, uh, haggis is a uh, common delicacy in Scotland. It is made out of sheep internal bits. Um, it's a tra very traditional food. Uh, it's delicious. Um, and the Americans will not allow it to be imported into the US because it's made of inclusion of lungs. And so this was a discussion which got very silly. And if you read fast, you'll discover that they end up talking about the mighty Führer of the sausage people, which if you translate an old Scottish poem into German and back again, I mean, sure, why that's relevant to anything, who knows, right? But the actual part of this is important, right? The FDA does not think that this is a safe food to have. The European Union and the British government do. It's also a traditional food, so there are certain protections there. Um, you know, that this phrase here, secondly, there is the US's unwillingness to recognize that animal lungs are an acceptable food stuff. You have two options, right? You change the US's mind on the import of lamb, or you just stop making haggis with lung, and maybe everyone will be happy. So these are the kind of ideas where even science comes into, you know, international trade. Um, other things that uh, we worked on whilst I was there, in the UK, we can now do three parent IVF. So in this case, IVF normally, you know, we, we fertilize a, an egg and a sperm together in a test tube. In the case where the mother has a mitochondrial disease, the, the UK has now authorized uh, mitochondrial transfer. So you can take mitochondria from a second woman, uh, replace the mitochondria in the egg with those mitochondria so that that mitochondrial disease is no longer there. Of course, that doesn't affect the DNA, of the baby that is born. It is still just the two parents. You've just got rid of the mitochondrial disease to make a baby. So you have these three parent babies. That's a very complex idea to explain to uh, a policymaker in government who doesn't have any science background, may not have taken science since they were 16 in high school. Um, and so the reason that these offices exist is to try and distill this information without making policy recommendations, right? It is just to say, this is what is happening. This is why we need it. And then let lawmakers have the information that they need to come to decisions that can impact um, society. So this was a very cool experience. The most exciting part about it for me was that I was allowed into the archives. Um, these are vellum scrolls. This is a total aside. But these are vellum scrolls. It's just very cool. These are vellum scrolls uh, of laws that were written in the UK in like the 1300s. Um, so this is just a lot of goat skins all sewn together and written on. Um, this one, the very large one, I think it's tax law. Who knows? But occasionally, you know, especially with Brexit happening uh, a few years ago, they would go and pull some of these very old laws out of the archive to justify certain, <laughs> certain decisions and unscroll the lambskin. And because it's a, an animal product, you can actually touch these with your hands because the oils that we have on our fingers are actually really good for hydrating the vellum so that they don't get brittle and you would never be able to open them again. So that was cool. You could just go and pull whatever old scroll you wanted and unroll it and have a look at it. And to give you some idea, oh, uh, oh backwards, backwards. Uh, this is me in the archive. <laughs> there are many, many scrolls, lots of laws. The UK doesn't have a constitution. Instead, we have this. Uh, gets complicated. Um, this is uh, Queen Elizabeth I's signature. Uh, actually, no, I lied. This is Henry VIII, he who had the six wives signing off on some law. I think it was granting some lord lands. Who, who really knows? Um, but the more interesting one, I think, for you guys is this is the original copy of the Declaration of Independence that was sent by the Americans to the British government to say, we're out, we're done. We no longer want to be part of you. So this. This was a very cool piece of paper to see. This one is not a scroll. This is actually paper. So they don't like you touching that, which I discovered the hard way when they, they shouted at me. Um, but it's, it's a very, very cool thing to have seen. And all that being said is I really thought I wanted to be a science policy uh, person. And it was fascinating, but I realized that my heart was at the bench and I liked doing science and not telling people about cool science that other people were doing. So. My conclusions, TLDR, TLDR. One, 
you do not need a 4.0 in college. People will tell you that you need a 4.0 in college. For most graduate programs and getting most jobs, uh, a 3.6 is good enough. And you, will, you can kill yourself trying to get that 4.0 and miss out half of what is good about college. Um, the friendships, the connections, the people. Do not beat yourself over the head if you drop a point in a class somewhere. Again, life is too short, you will do just fine. Not that I'm advocating don't work hard, but losing a point here and there is not the end of the world. Although the kind of people that I am certainly, you know, I would have beaten myself uh, over the head for every A that I didn't get when I was in high school. And you learn that actually nobody really cares. They care about your impact on the world. Two, your career will not be defined by your degree. I have a degree in physics. I'm now a molecular biologist. I'm technically an analytical scientist. Um, so I get called on to do a lot of biophysics but because people are like, oh, you understand these equations. Um, but I think about E. coli and squishy things every day. You are all highly intelligent people. If you decide to change your mind, that's fine. Do what you love. If you end up being a physicist who ends up being a biologist, if you end up being a biologist who turns into an environmental engineer, if you discover that uh, French poetry is your thing, do it. Um, you'll still have a very successful career, even if it's not what you thought it was going to be before you went to college. Uh, you will fail more than you succeed. Um, we don't like to talk about failure. I like to think actually one of the good things that the tech industry in Silicon Valley has given us is this idea of accepting failure more. Um, the uh, Google X, um, their like secret division, the guy who runs that, um, his mantra is fail fast. It doesn't matter. You're going to fail in a way. It matters how quickly you recover from it and try more things. If you're not failing, you're not learning, and so you'll never get to the answer you need. Not having an answer to, so what are you going to do is okay. When you come to the end of your senior year of high school, of college, of graduate school, into a job, and people ask you, oh, so what are you going to do next? It's a really stressful question. And being able to say, I don't know yet, or it's going to change is totally valid. Do not be afraid of that. Knowing your own limits is a strength, not a weakness. And this comes back to you will fail more than you succeed. Sometimes things are hard and you're not enjoying them. And you think you should do it because the world expects you to do it or people expect you to finish a degree or become a doctor or become an engineer. And sometimes the strongest thing you can do is to stop doing that thing. So know your limits. Know when you are not being true to yourself and true to what you are passionate about. Uh, only you're allowed to tell you what it is that you want to do. And all of that is tied together with find your joy. I still really love quantum mechanics. I don't do it anymore, but I still love it and I will read about it. And I am super excited when people publish papers about it. Um, but I also really love working in a job where the products that I'm making in my lab are directly helping patients who have no other options left in their cancer treatment. Knowing you're making an impact, that to me is my joy. Yours might be different um, and I'm excited for you all to find out what that is. You might find it tomorrow, you might not find it for 50 years, but you will and I'm excited for you to reach that point.